My name is Toy Flower. Uh, as you said, I'm creative director of this organisation, We Art We Do. And today I'm going to talk about this question here. How can we bridge the gap between what people want and what's good for people? And I'm going to talk about how collaboration, the theme of today's conference, can play a really important role in this. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've learned over my career over the last 10 years and how that sort of helped uh, me answer this question a little bit. Now, when I left university, I trained in advertising and I went to work for a big advertising agency. And um, I learned a huge amount about consumer products and services and brands. My role was to write adverts, so for TV and radio and print and web. Um, and one, one product that I got given to work on was Brill Cream. So Brill Cream were wanting to launch a new range that was aimed at young people. And what they'd done is they'd done a huge amount of consumer research, found out that there was a specific target market out there of young people, and they'd worked out what these people were wanting and needing. And they'd found out that these guys wanted to look good, but not look like they'd made any effort. So it sounds reasonable. So what we did was we created a campaign that built on these insights. And so what we did was we, uh, first of all, asked lots and lots of young people to send in videos of themselves doing effortless tricks. So these were things where it might be a guy that's standing on one side of the room, throws a Coke can and nonchalantly gets it in the bin on the other side of the room, perfectly getting it right. And of all these clips that got sent in, we picked one winner. And then that guy featured in our TV advert. Um, for Brill Cream. So in the 30 second spot, he went round, he did all these different tricks, he nonchalantly just got it all perfectly right, looking completely effortless. Um, and then at the end, he does his hair with his Brill Cream and the strap line comes up effortless. Now, my role in uh, taking that product to market was just at the very end point of a long process. So it started off by all these consumer insights and understanding exactly who our target audience was and what they wanted. And then from that, it had informed the complete design of everything about that product. So down to every detail of the product, the consistency of the gel, the number of items in the range, the price point it was sold at, the kind of shops it was sold at, and then of course the bit I was doing, which was communicating it to the uh, audience. And in fact, all consumer products and services go through this process of designing things to people's needs. And so when a young guy goes into a shop and he finds a product that is perfectly designed to suit his need of looking good, but not looking like he's made any effort, he of course buys it. Um, now, I learned, I learned a lot from the world of advertising. I think I learned the importance of looking at the world from the point of view of your customer. And I learned the importance of designing something that people actually want. Now, I left advertising about five years ago. I wanted to work on other issues that were a bit more socially focused. And I went to work for a behaviour change organisation called We Are What We Do, where I'm now creative director. Now, behaviour change is quite an interesting sector. You're basically nudging, encouraging, suggesting people make changes to their life in order to solve big social, environmental or health issues. And it's about changing their everyday behaviour so you can have a big impact on these issues. Now, the modern history of behaviour change in the UK um, arguably can be said to date back to what was being done by the Ministry of Information, which was set up during the First and Second World Wars. And they were putting out things like this, to, uh, telling us to save kitchen scraps to feed to hens, or things like this. Um, here's another one. They, these uh, posters that we're putting out, they were using uh, techniques that were trying to encourage lots of people to do it. So they did things like give very precise instructions, having a nice friendly lady that you might be able to empathise with who is telling you to do it. Sometimes they'd use very emotive language that would be really persuasive, trying to get you to change your ways. Um, and uh, techniques in the world of behaviour change have moved on since creating posters like this. Um, slightly more subtle things, so one example from the current government is they were trying to get people to, more people to pay taxes. And what they did is they subtly changed the wording of the letters that they send out to people to demand they pay their taxes, suggesting that lots of other people in the area had already paid them. And that kind of peer pressure massively influenced the number of people that paid their taxes. 
So there are these clever techniques that are being used now by governments and charities and different social organisations. But on the whole, I think we can say that we've got the world of behaviour change run by these social organisations on one side, and we've got the world of consumer products and services that are on the other side. So on the one hand, we've got the social sector. So the social sector are trying to get people to make good decisions. And on the other side, we've got the consumer sector. Now, the consumer sector are not so concerned that people are doing good things, but they're really, really good at making things that people want. So my question is, how can we bridge the gap between what people want and what's good for people? So, um, as an organisation that we are, we do, we try and answer this question. And one of the things that we try and do is talk about user value. Because what I'm not saying with this is that we should encourage people to be more materialistic or to consume more. But rather, we should uh, create things that have user value, which means that they are useful or desirable. And in doing so, that means that we're able to engage a much larger audience, and then we can have a bigger social impact. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to talk through three case studies of projects that our organisation have been involved in and just talk to you a little bit about how we try and create solutions that have lots of user value and how we create that user value by collaborating with different organisations who can bring new skills to our table. So the first example is plastic bags. Now this is a project that started back in 2007. And at that point, every person was using around 167 plastic bags a year per person. So over the UK, that adds up to about 10 billion plastic bags. Um, and when you think about the environmental impact of the raw plastic that goes into creating all of those, it has a huge effect. So what could we do to uh, start trying to tackle this problem? So people could either reuse the same bags over and over and over again, or they could bring their own... Uh, 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 bags to the supermarket that they could use. But what were the barriers to people doing this? So what we need to do is to think back to the world of advertising where we understand what the user need is and go and talk to people and understand their needs. And when you try and understand that, you realise that people do not want to be perceived as being eco, necessarily. They don't want to be seen as being hippies. They didn't want to be perceived as being thrifty or tight or budget. But they did want to be seen as being stylish. So we thought, how could we uh, redesign a solution here which could make bringing your own plastic bag to the supermarket more appealing? So what we did was we created a really beautiful, a really desirable, really practical bag. And this is where collaboration came in. Because we wouldn't have the skill set inside our team to design a fashion accessory. So we went and we worked with the UK's leading accessory designer, Anja Heimarsh, who was able to bring an amazing skill set to the table who could uh, create something that was so beautiful and desirable that it meant that uh, celebrities were using it, were seen on the arms of Kylie Minogue and Sienna Miller and all sorts of other people. Thousands of people were queuing up to use it. It sold out in a matter of hours. Um, and most importantly, it brought the quite unsexy issue of plastic bag usage suddenly to the pages of Grazia and Vogue and the new audience talking about it. Now, importantly, is the environmental impact of this work. And in the two years that follows us creating this uh, bag, um, Sainsbury's, who are our partner on the project, um, reported a 58% decrease in the number of plastic bags that they gave away. And obviously there was a lot of PR, there were a lot of other things that were going on at the time, but we felt that we definitely played an important part in that. Now the um, second uh, case study I just want to talk about is around poor diets. Now if you look around the high streets of London and many other cities, particularly in low income areas, we're finding that we are being completely dominated by unhealthy fast food outlets. So I'm just going to show you, this is a map of Forest Gate in Newham, in East London. The large blue squares are secondary schools, the small blue squares are primary schools, and the red dots are fast food outlets. What kind of places are they? Um, places like this. So they tend to be independents, they tend to be serving deep fried chicken, and they tend to be serving really unhealthy food. So this is food that's really high in saturated fat, sugar, salt, calories, and really lacking in vitamins and minerals. 
And so if you're a kid that's coming out of those schools in Forest Gate or any of the other areas in London where you are seeing this, they're going past these places every day and they are eating in there weekly, often daily, and it's having a really detrimental effect on their, on their physical health. So how can we design a solution that actually tries to tackle this? So once again, we need to go back to our target audience and find out actually what are their needs, what do they want. And so we did a huge amount of research. We spoke to a lot of young people. We ran um, workshops and did surveys and we watched people in chicken shops and we uh, found out that the main appeal that got people into these different places was if a place was cheap, close, quick and served tasty food. So our question was, if you could tick these four boxes but also create something that was healthy, could that be popular? So what we did was we created a mobile, healthy, fast food outlet in Forest Gate in Newham. This was just a pilot, so it's open for four weeks back in October last year, and um, created uh, some, some healthy food that was being sold there. Again, collaboration was really important. We needed to create, uh, work with somebody that was absolutely expert in creating street food. So we collaborated with a fantastic partner on that. Together we devised the menu. So again, it was going back to the user insights, going back to what young people want. They wanted chicken, they wanted vegetables not obvious, it had to be hidden away. So we devised the menu. We created a brand. So it had to be something that was appealing to teenagers. So in terms of the name, the logo, the visual identity and everything, it had a subtle nod to the chicken shops that we knew that young people loved. And then it had to be financially sustainable. We had to make it affordable so that it could be competitive with the, uh, the chicken shops that we're seeing. So we had meals that were £2.50, snacks were £1.50. And then in order to get that to work, we then had to devise a kind of financial model, that business model that would allow this to happen. And so that involves us working with councils to get free pitches on condition of hitting health benefits and doing a youth employment scheme which sees young people being trained up but giving our vendors a, uh, an, an unpaid sous chef. So um, the most important question was, was it popular? And it was. We, um, in the four weeks, we sold around 1,500 portions. There was an upward trajectory of sales over the time. Lots of repeat customers who so we were really happy. Compared to a meal at KFC, the nutritional content was a lot better for the young people. So that was fantastic. And so what we're doing now is looking at scaling this up. So in the start of the new academic term in September, we're going to be opening five pitches on a long-term basis that will be in boroughs in north and east um, London. And what these are going to be doing is providing access to healthy, but also appealing and affordable food to a really large audience of young people. Now, my final case study is around the issue of mental health. So mental health is a, it's a really serious issue. It affects um, one in four people at some point in their lives, and half those cases start by the time you're age 14. Um, it has enormous effects on the, the lives of individuals, but also their friends and families, and society as a whole. It costs the NHS billions of pounds to deal with, and it's also associated with a lot of issues like long-term unemployment and crime. So it's a very serious issue. And recently, it's been shown that preventative approaches to mental health can play a really positive effect. So just as with our, our physical health, there are things that we can all do every day, like eating well and exercising, which can be shown to have a really good long-term effect on our physical health. The same is true with our mental health, and there are things that we can do that can build resilience, that can increase our well-being and reduce the long-term risks of getting uh, mental health problems. So there are things that are out there, but how do you get young people who are target markets on this project to do these things to increase their well-being? Well, there are things like messaging campaigns, there's education and PSHE lessons in schools, um, you can do yoga classes and meditation classes, but we need to go back to um, the question, the, the point that was raised that I learned from the world of advertising about designing something that people actually want. And so, when you go back to, to young people, and we spent, uh, spent a lot of time uh, talking to people who worked with young people, we found that this big insight of the importance of non-stigmatised solutions. So mental health is still quite a taboo subject. Your average teenager doesn't really want to be associated with any kind of activity that's about improving their mental health. And particularly the specific target audience that we were looking at, which was 12 to 13 year old boys, who at that age, you just want to fit in with your friends and you don't want to open yourself up to ridicule in any way. So what could we do? 
So we designed, or we are designing, we're in the process of doing it, a computer game that improves your well-being. So the way this works is um, it builds breathing regulation training into the actual gameplay. So basically, the more you can control your emotions in real life, the better your character does in the game. And the way that it measures your ability to control your emotions in real life is by using biofeedback te technology. So this is measuring your, your heart, heartbeat, um, either through wristbands or through even T-shirts, you can do it now. And by measuring that, it uh, integrates that data into the game and affects your character. So basically, the more you play the game, the better you are, the, uh, you are regulating your emotions, you develop habits in, in doing that, and then that improves your, your long-term mental health. Again, collaboration has to play a really important role here because we, we couldn't design a really popular computer game with the skill set that we have in our, in our team as experts in behaviour change, but we're not experts in designing computer games. So I think this is, again, where you have to go and work with people who can create things that are really desirable and useful to your target audience by working with specialists. So for us, it was working with PlayLab London, who are an organisation that designed computer games. And they were able to create something that hopefully is able to compete with the likes of Angry Birds in terms of playability, because that's what you're going to need to do to engage that audience. Um, now, working with young people and going back to your users and getting insights is always important. So we continually do this. We go back, so we're testing it now, and you find out how difficult does the game need to be? How long should it be? What should it look like? And all of that gets built into it, so you can make this as, as much user value as possible. So what we're going to be doing with the, um, the video game is just piloting it in the next few months and looking to scale this further. But hopefully those three case studies have shown you a little bit about how we can start answering this question, about how we can bridge the gap between what people want and what's good for people. And hopefully I've shown that creating things with user value, so that means that people can really want or desire to use it, is one way of engaging a much larger audience. You can have a much greater social impact and how collaboration can play a really key role in that. Thank you very much.